everybody and welcome to this uh, meeting of the Education and Skills Transformation Committee on Wednesday the 18th of September 2024, a sunny afternoon in Swansea. Can you believe it? It's very exciting indeed. Um, so I'm going to dive straight into the agenda. Item number one, apologies for absence. I've got Helen morgan Rees and Councillor Robert Smith was intended to be here, but uh, they've both been caught up in, a, in a, another event. Are there any others, Gareth? And no other apologies. OK, thank you. Uh, disclosure of personal and prejudicial interests. I'm going to mention my association as an employee of the University of Wales Trinity St. David because we've got a friend and colleague of mine who's kindly uh, agreed to join us today to offer some very important insights into learner progress. Um, are there any others, any other declarations of personal disclosures of personal prejudicial interests? No. OK, so moving on to the minutes. We've got three pages of minutes here. If you're happy, I will approve and sign them as a correct record. Can we go through page one, page two, and page three? Can I mention on page two, there's a typo on page two, which needs to be, so it's under minute 12. Down the bottom of the page, it says number one, overview, and number two, how to quality issue. I think that should read how to uh, quality assure. Di, I think that's correct, is it? Quality assurance, yeah? Agreed. So if we can tell, we can amend that. Thanks, Gareth. And then page three. Are we all happy? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. So then I'll, I'll sign as a true record of the meeting. So we move on to agenda item number uh, four. And before I introduce... Um, uh, my colleague from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, Elaine Sharplin. Can, can I just ask us very quickly to say who we are? Can we do a quick introduction? Because it's nice for, for for Elaine to know who's in the room. Of course, I'm Councillor Mike Dirk. Uh, Lorraine, um, Elaine knows me quite well. Can I go around the screen there? Gareth? Yeah, Gareth Borsden from Democratic Services. Caroline? And my colleague from Democrat. All right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Right. She's doing the streaming. Sorry. Di. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's David. In brackets, Di Thomas, and I'm the principal school improvement advisor um, for the education directorate. Thanks, Di. Melissa. Good afternoon, um, Melissa Perry, solicitor in the education department. Thanks, Melissa. Sarah. Yeah, uh, Sarah Hughes, Team Manager for Education Strategy. What can I read there? KR, what can I read? KR on the screen, I can see that. Cornelia. Cornelia. Yep, that's right. Hi, uh, my name's Cornelia Ribbekite. I'm the paralegal for the Education Department. Thank you very much. Bev? Um, afternoon, I'm Councillor Beverly Hopkins and I represent the Landor Board. Thanks, Bev. Lyndon? On mute, Lyndon. Apologies. Uh, Lind Lyndon Jones, councillor for Bishopston Ward. Thanks, Lyndon. Mike? Yeah, councillor Mike White. I represent the Landor Ward. Thank you, Mike. Fiona? Hi, councillor Fiona Gordon. I represent Castle Ward. Sam? Councillor Sam Pritchard, representing Money's Bar. Thank you, Sam. And last but certainly not least, uh, Councillor Yvonne Jardine. Councillor Yvonne Jardine, representing Morriston Ward. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, all. So we, we can move on proper to item number four now. Can I ask Di just to say a few words to introduce Elaine before she... Uh, oh, sorry, Sandra Joy in the room. Oh, my goodness me. I to apologise. I wasn't going to say a word then. <laughs> Councillor Sandra Joy Evans for what? I should sack myself. I'm terrible. You're there. I can look in across at you. Oh, goodness. OK, so can I ask Di if you could introduce Elaine for me, please, before her presentation? Diolch, Chair, and Pranam Dapau. So um, the background to this piece of work is to develop um, a principle of progression for Swansea. So we've got some clear expectations across our education piece in terms of our um, what we expect from our schools 
and settings in order to support a better understanding of pupil progress and learner progress across our schools and settings in Swansea. And to that end, um, it's it would have, it's been useful to reach out um, to some of our partners. And one of our key stakeholder partners is obviously the university. Uh, Trinity St David, of which Elaine is the research director. So I welcome Elaine to the meeting today, and and she's been um, endlessly helpful um, in this segment of the work to develop um, some more detailed, overarching principles for us, so that we can steer this work. So my thanks to Elaine, um, who's going to provide the backdrop and some um, some work around um, around this piece, and then it'll lead into my piece. I'm following that. So I hope that gives Elaine um, a nice introduction and then chair hand back to you. Thank you very much, Di, and over to Elaine. Thank you ever so much, Chair, and thank you, Di, for the warm words of uh, welcome. So um, I'm going to just share some thinking, perhaps, is the best way to frame it uh, with you today. Certainly, it's not my uh, place or position to give you rights or wrongs about anything, but perhaps some stimulate some discussion amongst yourselves when you think about Curriculum for Wales and learner progression. And most of this thinking comes from the CAMI project, CAMI Divodo, which is a government-funded um, research project with uh, Trinity St David and the University of Glasgow, uh, where we've been working with teachers, the middle tier, higher education um, input and the inspectorate on uh, understanding learner progression. Next slide, please. And perhaps this is the most uh, important slide here. You can't see the sand dunes on the screen for some reason, but it's a picture of sand dunes and then the grains of sand. And it's always important to hold in your minds when you're thinking of Curriculum for Wales that um, it's based on the principles of subsidiarity. So that's what we call reverse delegation, so that power is given to teachers and school leaders to build the curriculum from the ground up. And it's the place of um, government, whether it be local or national, uh, to provide guiding frameworks for teachers to work in this space. So one thing to think about is what that looks like um, for Swansea, operating within a guiding framework whilst retaining the autonomy that teachers are afforded uh, through Curriculum for Wales. And this is probably the greatest tension that we are discovering as we complete our work. And it's not a static uh, relationship. There's a toing and froing of should government provide more guidance? Should it provide less guidance? How much variation will be tolerated within a system? Do teachers need more support? Um, it's worth noting, of course, teachers are not curriculum designers by trade. They've been used to a culture of a national curriculum where you deliver something, um, not design something. They're also been framed by performativity cultures, inspection, standards, traffic lighting. All of this has framed their very being. And now they're being asked to design their own curriculum. Next slide, please. And so the CAMI findings were on the third stage of our project, and these are findings from phase one, working with teachers. The first point then is that tension that I just stoke, spoke about, a midway place needs to be found. Maintaining teacher autonomy, giving guiding principles so you don't end up with too much variation. What kind of curriculum is Curriculum for Wales? Now, these are quite kind of educationalist terms that it's purpose led, process orientated, but there's some thinking to be done about the relationship between the curriculum, assessment, and the pedagogy, the way that we teach. And then the third point is a bit of a warning um, to folk that we all like our, you know, Hello Fresh kind of meals where we can create our dinner out of the box, but off the shelf. Um, packages that uh, always appear at this kind of time where there's curriculum reform. Entrepreneurs are waiting at the edge to dive into this space. So you need to be a little bit cautious 
uh, and make sure that they're aligned to Curriculum for Wales. Next slide, please. OK, so these are some of the feedback from teachers. Um, first is that there's too much noise in the system, so uh, they're overwhelmed by documentation. And this is the risk of governments uh, giving guidance upon guidance upon guidance. So the guidance, first round of guidance isn't clearly understood. Teachers say we need more help with things, so government issues more guidance. That confuses the first guidance and we are in lots of iterations of guidance. So that's something to be aware of. Remember, we're trying to always operate without top-down policy. Time. Reading all this guidance, thinking about it in an intelligent and a careful way takes time, and teachers are time poor. So we can't just ask more and more of them without giving them space. This is an important one that came out, that the system, Curriculum for Wales, will tolerate some variants. So not every school needs to be doing the, exactly the same thing because that won't meet the needs of individual learners in that context. So we have to be courageous in holding on to the fact that schools will be doing different things. And then the third point there, which is an ongoing discussion, um, lots of people, including myself, are not always clear about how progression is understood. Uh, it's actually quite a complex thing to explain and understand. Um, so we can think about that bit a bit more now. Next slide, please. And the next one then. So in its simplest terms, and this is where you think, yeah, I've got this, I understand what progression is. It just means getting better at things. So an increased sophistication of understanding as you move from one place to another. And we know that, don't we, with any skill that we learn, musical instrument, knitting, bake off, the sewing bee, any of those things. You start off as a novice and then you become more expert at it. But that's complicated in education because we have to decide what things are you going to get better at. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, in Curriculum for Wales, then we've got our uh, progression steps that sort of set out um, where our journey of progression should be. We know that we're starting at progression step one and we're heading towards progression step five. Next slide, please. That's set out in documentation. But each child's journey, each learner's journey from progression step one to progression step five is not linear. And that's very important to grasp. There will be twists, there will be turns, there will be going backwards, there will be going forwards, there'll be parking in a lay-by. Sometimes you'll be in a Formula One car, sometimes you'll be in the wheelbarrow. Learning just does not happen in a linear way. And the reason I'm stressing this point is that um, we need to move away from the idea that the curriculum is set out before you and you journey through it because if we have that in our minds you'll be left behind because the teacher will move on to the next step of the journey and you'll still be in your wheelbarrow in a lay-by um, and then we need to understand why these things happen and we know that childhood trauma we know that moving house we know that transition points whether they be within the classroom or within schools often cause this regression in learning uh, COVID perhaps is the most important one in our minds at the moment. So we need to think about these things when we're planning. Next slide, please. And then when we're thinking about progression, we have to think about the horizontal. So across the mountain tops, if you like, progression over time. So maybe year one, year two, year three, whatever. But also progression in time. So how does progression happen more lesson by lesson by lesson? I told you it's complicated. Next step, please. So internationally, then uh, we'll just have a look at a few quotes then uh, and you'll be able to see why curriculum for Wales relates to progression steps then uh, across international reading. 
no one in uh, education talks about progression um, as an age related step. And any teacher will tell you that you can't just um, say by the age of seven, you should be doing. That's not fair to learners, especially learners with additional needs. It's this continuum of increasing expertise. So everyone has an individual journey. Next slide, please. And then this idea then that those steps across the mountain tops need to be joined up thinking. So when schools are planning their curriculum, their, their plan needs to be coherent in the increasing sophistication. That's what's set out in the descriptions of learning. So it can't be activity driven. You can't just think, oh, well, it'd be great if we made junk dinosaurs today and then tomorrow we're going to do the willow plate pattern. Those are just activities. You need to think about how the learning um, is going to be connected. What does it mean to learn about electricity when you're on progression step one? What does it mean to learn about electric uh, electricity when you're on progression step five? And how are those joined up then? Next one, please. And then can I then have framed progression as the interplay or the connection or the ways that these three things work. So pedagogy, assessment and curriculum. How are they working in your school? So how are we teaching? Are you teaching whole class? Are you teaching in small groups? Are you teaching retrieval practice? All different ways of teaching. How is the assessment working across the mountain tops and within the mountain? How do you know that learning has happened? Remember, learning is invisible. It happens in children's heads. So you have to find ways of making that invisible learning visible to you as a teacher. What you intend to teach may not be learned. And then the curriculum, the why. Why are we teaching this curriculum in this school for our learners? Thank you. Next slide. And then that brings us to assessment for learning then. So how do you plan your assessment for learning? And I know that um, Daya's got some thoughts about how schools use assessment for learning, learning in the moment and learning across the mountain tops. Thank you. Next slide. And the next one. And so then I'll conclude. My 15 minutes is nearly up then. And uh, the concluding quote is to hold in your mind then that you want that journey of learning that's coherent, not in the sense of every school doing the same thing, but coherent in that the little steps of learning make sense to each other. They're connected to each other like Lego. Um, so what I've learned in progression step two, I can use and build on for progression step three. The activities come after. And so we are moving away from the practice of learning being activity driven to one where learning progression is at the heart. And that summarizes three years work, Mike, in about 12 minutes. So. Thank you, Chair. That, that was excellent. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, very insightful. And and twelve minutes boiled down into, into uh, to, uh, three years boiled down into twelve minutes is no mean feat at all. I uh, can ask committee members for for any questions or of Elaine, please. Um, can I ask just to get things going, Elaine? Your work covering you know a large area. Um, have you found you know particular um stresses and strains in, as we call in this committee, and I, I has pointed out a number of times, in practitioners in schools across Wales. Have we seen a particular and maybe new stresses and strains, maybe as an unavoided consequence of the new of the new approach in Wales education? I think, I think we, on? yeah, we, oh, you are. Sorry. we have found every kind of stress and strain. So schools that um, are high performing um, have got, you know, great results. 
are thinking how can curriculum for Wales kind of feed into that successful context, if you like. Um, we've got um, the time is definitely the biggest stress and strain. It takes time for people to get their heads around this way of thinking about the curriculum and undoing historic practice or historic thinking, should we say, that that is difficult. Um, and then this variance, I'm not sure that government um, quite envisioned, envisioned how this variance would look uh, school by school by school. Uh, post COVID, we've got uh, the missing children, so non attendance, some behaviour challenges perhaps. Um, but then we've got great successes, and they are where schools work together, especially across the primary secondary divide. So to get that coherence from progression step one to progression step five, cluster working, where people are talking about what the coherence looks like long term, what Donaldson says, clear, clear lines of sight. Um, those are the biggest um, successes. Excellent. Thanks, Elaine. Right. I can't see anybody indicating at the moment. What we can do is we can move on to. Oh, yes, I have got Councillor Fiona Gordon's hand going up. Fiona. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks, Elaine. Um, I was interested in um, you talking about the balance between providing schools with structure and allowing them the, their autonomy to develop their own curricula. Um, and I just wondered. Um, in you know where are you in in terms of the project can my divorce doll is it um is uh, what, what is the time scale for the project and will one of the outcomes of that then be a recommendation to develop some sort of structure for schools or have schools already been provided with structures to support them there are there are thank you for the question uh we are in our third and final year now of the project and uh, some guidance has already been published by CAMI on assessment, for example, assessing for the future. I can direct you to that. Uh, that's on Hub. Um, and then guidance to government has been really to um, be very careful about the guidance that's being um, issued to try and mitigate that noise in the system. Um, and to allow time and space for people to engage uh, with materials that are already there and to encourage this uh, cluster working. Um, I think we're very mindful of asking for more guidance to be given to schools means we've discovered through the research that there's too much noise in the system. Uh, and there's no easy answer to that. Um, and the focus needs to be on developing teachers as curriculum builders so they have the confidence to operate within the guidance that's there mm. rather than be more cautious and say tell me what to do am i doing it right mm. okay thank you thanks fiona elaine that, that's really interesting we, we're aiming to produce a set of swansea principles and i think i'm right in saying that that aims in part to give all educational practitioners, practitioners confidence that, that in a sense that we, we are with you, uh, we trust you, we trust your professionalism, we trust your enthusiasm and your passion for education uh, and to all to take away what I've, I've wrote down a few times in your presentation is like a, a fear and a confusion and a high level of stress to take that away. I sometimes refer to a bonfire of bureaucracy that's needed. Mm -hmm. Take some things away in order for teachers to take on these new responsibilities. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, we've got Councillor Lyndon Jones next. Right, th th thanks uh, very much for the uh, <clears throat> for the presentation. Um, I think one thing is key. I've said it before, but listening to your presentation, I think there is a need for support for teachers, uh, real support, because um, uh, what they've been asked to do, it's quite busy to say the least. Um, and I agree with you that you get need to take the noise out of the system, and but you do need to give them that support. Um, I know uh, in education scrutiny in Swansea, we've met uh, uh, the comprehensive school, different comprehensive schools and schools that make up their cluster uh, to see how 
the cluster of primary schools were working towards the work of the, that the that the comprehensive school did, and some better than others, but interesting journeys. But I think really key is uh, you know when a lot of teachers who've been in the profession a long time never signed up for this, and therefore it is vital that we actually hold their hands uh, to make sure that they can deliver, because otherwise the only people who are going to suffer are the pupils. Yeah, can I just come back on that, if that's OK? Thank you very much for that comment. You're absolutely right. And uh, perhaps one of the other things to consider when you're uh, constructing your principles is, one, the communication of those, uh, when they're communication, communicated to the sector and, and the messaging that, that goes around them, and um, to make sure they're not interpreted as any kind of measurements, uh, accountability, um, structure so people don't start thinking they're going to be judged by those principles. That's lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Elaine. Uh, and of course, that's a danger in, in the system. And I think previously, one of the points that I felt coming through our discussions is that feeling of we've done it one way for a long time. Um, you know, we know what the target is. We know what the exp expectations are and almost a desire for that old way of thinking to be replaced by somebody equally kind of prescriptive. Yeah. There's a big ish challenge there, there's a balance. Um, Councillor Yvonne Jardine, please. Oh, thanks, Pierre. Um, Elaine, thanks for the presentation. I'm not sure if this question is relevant now, but you mentioned amongst other things, structure, the children who are missing school, because of COVID, the poor attendance, etc. since. And I was just wondering how children who are homeschooled or not attending school regularly, but mainly children who are supposedly homeschooled, how will they fit in? How will we ensure that they have the structure that we're saying they, that's needed? And how will we ensure that they are keeping up? I know, I know, I know it's a tricky one because it's quite a difficulty now. But I was just thinking with something new coming on board. You know, I haven't heard anything mentioned about homeschooling. And as I said, because I can see David has put his hand up, that it might not be a question for now, but I just thought I'd ask it. OK, can I can I just ask, sorry, um, Mike, can I just ask uh, Di if he wants to offer a comment? Yeah, uh, Councillor Jardine, you're, you're right. This forum, not necessarily the place for it with the agenda provided, however, uh, and more one for the vulnerable learner piece of work chair, potentially. However, what I can tell you is um, the staff responsibility for the local authority remains, um, not only from a safeguarding perspective, from a perspective, Councillor Jardine, that you refer to in terms of standards, um, but the elective home education team um, see it the same way that we do. So um, although we won't be able to impose the principles that underpin the work that we're trying to achieve here in terms of those who provide the education for those at home, but we will be sharing these principles through those communications, through those interactions with those learners whilst they're in their home setting and or other settings. So, yeah, those colleagues will be involved in those discussions, um, but it's certainly more one for the vulnerable learners team. However, you know, we'll, we'll be sharing the messages. Thanks, Thanks Elaine. Elaine, did you want Thanks, to add anything? I, I just wanted to add one point, which is that only today, I think there's a report um, from Welsh Government on the number of children who aren't in um, formal education settings, and I think the numbers have increased uh, quite significantly. I think off the top of my head, I only saw it on Twitter, off the top of my head, it's something like 27,000 children are not are registered with GPs, but not registered in formal education settings. Thank you very Thanks much, Elaine. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Yvonne. Councillor Mike White. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair, and thanks for the... Um... The, the the report today, the presentation. Can I just ask, you mentioned uh, working in cluster groups. What monitoring is going on to make sure that all the clusters are going at all at the same pace? Is there any sort of pro, uh, provisions in place for, for, for that to, to obviously give support to the schools? 
Thanks, Mike. Can I ask Di if you can offer a perspective? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor White. Um, well, in essence, um, on a broader scale, the, the principles that um, that have been outlined by Elaine um, grow. So that, that autonomy um, grows when you look at a cluster, because, of course, not now have you got um, in isolation one school and the context around it. You've got multiple schools and a broader context, which would include a geographical area. So in terms of compliance to the principles that we um, that have been set before us, we, we've not got um, a formal way that we're checking, for want of a better phrase, um, that our cluster colleagues are undertaking that. However, we know that cluster meetings take place, regular head teacher meetings take place. We know that clusters have developed a shared understanding and progression through um, curriculum maps and or uh, medium term curriculum plans. Um, we know through our primary and our secondary head teacher meetings in collaboration with our cross phase head teacher meetings that those conversations bear fruit and that learners have a good deal when they make the transition from primary to secondary and such like. However, we do know that we need to bolster work in this area and the support for the transition needs to, um, we've identified that as a local authority. So to that end, uh, Councillor White, what we have done um, um, through the Delegated Powers Report, we are, we have appointed um, uh, on an interim basis somebody to support schools and settings um, with that transition piece of work um, to further embed the principles of the 3 to 16 continuum. So it's good, but we'd like it to be even better. And we've got very few examples where Estin, the inspectorate, have highlighted this as an issue in Swansea, but they do make note that, that occasionally we need to plan better for the 3 to 16 continuum. So in essence, it's going well. However, we're going to provide some additional support through the school improvement team via a dedicated officer. Thank you, Dai. Is that okay, Mike? Yes, yes, thanks, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I can't see anyone indicating. I'm looking at Councillor Sandra Joy. No, sorry, Sandra. Okay, then. So on that point, can we move on? Can I thank Elaine very much indeed for your efforts there? It offers us excellent insight and, and real food for thought for, for the committee. And can I move on then to, to Dai, who is going to, to, uh, to take things a bit further? for us now elaine you can stay for the rest of the meeting if you want more than welcome if you want to or you can leave up to you there we are no no more than welcome Dai. thanks chair um if it's possible to have the presentation shared that would be great so diolch thank you OK, firstly, Elaine, I got a I got a tough act to follow, so my apologies, colleagues. Um, I, it, I certainly won't be as dynamic as Elaine, uh, neither is it as um, as visual. But so o overall, um, what we've got in front of us is um, the basis of the principles that we would like to see that would underpin some support uh, in terms of a document for schools in Swansea. So next slide, please. So um, the this slide is from based on guidance, Welsh Government guidance, and none of us um, feel the need to come away from that guidance, certainly it brings true. And essentially what we're trying to understand here is pupil progress um, is underpinned and intertwined by assessment. And I spoke to you last time, the difference between the perception of assessment and assessments. And um, I think we just need to be careful that we don't um, request and require schools to undertake certain um, assessments. That's going to be for the school based settings in order to do. But the role of assessment um, I'm going to try and set out now. So first of all, the role of assessment is to en enable individual pupil progress that is appropriate to their individual needs. Um, its principal aim is going to make sure that whatever we do, however we assess a pupil, that it provides us with opportunities as teachers and practitioners to challenge and support that pupil. So in that pictorial diagram that Elaine showed us, that they make progress 
in the moment and over time. Assessment should continue um, and contribute to the holistic um, picture of a learner. And what that word holistic means is it's not in a specific area that it looks at the overall progress of an individual child. So we take into consideration the, the numerous and ma the numeracy and maths ability, their linguistic ability, their um, their, uh, their health and well-being, their, the range of things. Um, and there is the statutory responsibility for us to provide a, a curriculum for three to 16. So it is a continuum, as Elaine has described. It is set out in areas of learning and experience, but it provides that progress and that progress is continuous um, and that we have high expectations um, for our learners as they progress, but as they're ready. And in terms of providing that challenge and support, it's also required that assessment will um, support um, the information for teaching and learning. So actually we act on um, the, the challenges that pupils required through our teaching. It also supports our curriculum design, so um, we can't disaggregate curriculum design from the approaches to assessment. So pupil progress informs how we design our curriculum and our curriculum supports how pupils make progress. Um, they're interdependent and the assessment should allow us to consider new innovative approaches to teaching and learning and, um, uh, and find out the best ways for our pupils to learn. Next slide, please. So three overarching roles here, which I've described in a bit more detail previously, but individual progress of pupils on a day to day basis. What does that look like in principle on a day to day basis? The second being identifying and capturing that pupil progress over a longer period of time. So how does that what does that look like? And then the third role of assessment, one that we're not going to spend too much time considering it initially, would how does assessment help us as leaders and practitioners to understand the progress that groups of learners make? Um, and that's important because that helps us to reflect on what we do as schools. So I'm going to use that last item as a school improvement approach. Next slide, please. So considering the first item that's supporting individual learners on a day to day basis. These are the things that it must do. OK, or well, I've used the word should, but um, a little softer. So we, we do need to identify individual strengths so we can celebrate so that we can engage learners. We, of course, need to identify those individual achievements for the same purpose so that, as Elaine described, we can build on those early steps as children move through those progression steps. It should help us to identify any barriers that exist for individual learners so we can try and remove some of those. For example, where there's an additional learner need, how do we put support and scaffold in place to remove that barrier? And it should provide ample opportunities for practitioners to discuss learner progress with the pupils themselves. So can pupils identify what was effective to help them to learn that? Can pupils identify the learning themselves? And ultimately, from, from our perspective, in um, supporting day-to-day -day progress helps us to identify the challenge and or the support required for each learners. And overarching, it should be embedded into teaching. It shouldn't be something that we do as a, an, an assessment week, for example, although that does happen for certain, um, and then there is validity to that but it should be embedded into day-to-day -day practice and it should allow us, it should, it should give us the ability to respond to individual needs. So each individual has the opportunity to have almost a bespoke um, and tailored approach to their needs. Next slide, please. The second element of the, the purpose of assessment um, would be for us to use assessment records where they're appropriate in order to support and identify the progress. And what I mean by assessment records um, is information. And we used to use the word data. The word data has been removed from um, guidance. So how do we use assessment records and information to inform the progress? It isn't the only way that informs progress, but how do we use it? 
how do we use it to identify progress um, for different periods of time? So, because there might well be progress made at the start of the year, there might be progress at the end of the year, etc. Um, we need to use it in a variety of ways so that it can inform our, our judgment of progress. It should be able to help us not only to learn about the progress, but how a learner has learned. So that underpins or is underpinned by our pedagogical approach, the way that we teach. So it's really important to learn how learners, how pupils learn in order for us to emulate that and in order for them to identify that learning and continue it. What pupils have learned shouldn't come first, but it is important to reflect on what um, pupils have learned. And this word is a key one for mine, is what can pupils demonstrate? Um, it's similar to what they can do, but being able to demonstrate the learning is key. Next item, please. So why is this useful um, when we reflect? Well, reflection on learning and on progress um, is going to help those practitioners give feedback to learners and or feed forward. So what is the next step for each individual learner? It'll help practitioners to plan forwards. So the forward look, I'm talking about the next lesson or the next set of lessons, um, the, the medium term curriculum planning in terms of that reflection. It's certainly going to help us to inform our interventions. So where we've got some formal interventions in place, either for pupils who've got additional learning needs or um, where there's um, informal interventions um, for pupils who just need a little bit of a boost in a certain area. Um, I've already mentioned, but it will inform the immediate next steps for those learners. Um, and I mean about the little conversation you have with a pupil whilst they're working, what can you do to say to them that helps them to move that learning on in the moment? And we want to help pupils, young people develop longer term goals and objectives. And overall, this will help us, the reflection on progress will help us to report to parents and carers. Next slide, please. And this last part that I mentioned I wouldn't go into too much detail about, um, it, it's useful to know how different learners make progress. And, and that's because um, it'll help us through a school improvement lens, see what our provision, the impact of our provision has on larger groups. It does help us to identify, or it's an easier way of identifying our curriculum strengths and areas for development, because a larger group helps us to understand that. It helps us to understand how our provision is meeting the needs of learners and therefore enables us being a key part of our work to share effective practice, growing the system. And um, it certainly helps us to identify and know how schools should and could support, for example, disadvantaged learners. It's a key item for us through the um, um, the Pupil Development Grant, if that's a group of learners, um, we can learn from the, the, the progress that they make um, in order to make um, our provision much more suitable. And the last point is where I see this piece. Um, it supports robust self-evaluation and improvement planning. So we can identify and monitor, track the progress that individual groups of learners make in order to support school improvement. Next slide, please. So just to draw this um, um, to some sense of summary, where we note that assessment is a particularly strong feature of a school or setting, formative assessment has a really clear role in improving teaching and it helps people to understand their learning. So formative assessment um, has a really clear role in teaching, so they're intertwined. Um, where assessment is effective, um, that effective practice um, is clear. We can really identify that. And the schools use a range of strategies um, to support the learners and the assessment in, a, in their context. OK, so it's not just one. It's a range of um, different strategies. And effective assessment identifies the progress that are making across the curriculum, so not in narrow fields how is that pupil making progress holistically across the curriculum, not just in one or two areas? Next slide, please. 
I think this is the last slide. So effective assessment, simply put, informs how our teaching can be changed and adjusted um, in response to the information that we've gathered. So what do we do differently as a result of the information that we've gathered through assessment? And good systems for assessment inform the professional learning for our school-based staff, and it is effective in terms of how we shift our pedagogy, our teaching and learning approaches. And all in all, good systems for assessment across those schools and settings support a reflective culture. We talked about reflection today. So how does that assessment facilitate professional dialogue with parents, with pupils, with the wider stakeholder groups in order to reflect on our, um, our strengths and areas for improvement? Apologies. So in terms of what I see as our next steps, Jay, and hopefully um, this will be a point by which we can allow um, members to consider further, is we do need to outline these principles of effective formative assessment. That would be something that I think we could do next. We should make broad references um, to a range of strategies that can support effective assessment. We can't be specific. Um, I think we need to develop a better understanding of what constitutes effective feedback stroke feed forward to learners. Develop a better understanding of what constitutes effective next step planning for learners. So Elaine spoke about building blocks. What do we provide learners as a next step in order them for them to make progress in the moment and over time? And we need to gain intelligence and document and share examples where this has been effective. I think that's the end of the slides. Yes, so a real whistle stop tour to uh, through some of the principles um, there, Chair, and I'm obviously open that up to the floor for questions. Thank you, Dave. And again, as members, um, indicate their intention to ask a, a question. Can I just make a few observations? It seems that we've got a sense of momentum, Di, which is always great to see. And you've got the habit of posing challenges, suggesting solutions, and then looking ahead, of, as you've done very helpfully there, with, with, with what next thinking. And members should be mindful that we've got uh, two more learner progress committee meetings. One of the we come to the work plan, but one in December and one in February. So that momentum needs to come to a position in February where we are tying up the loose ends and we've got something really nailed down, uh, which makes sense. Um, can I just make a few, uh, um, raise a, a question uh, here? I'm conscious about Elaine's focus on overburdening the overburdened. That seems to be there. Um, how can we reduce that burden? How can we take some of the pressures off? When we had a, in this committee, um, a previous committee in previous years, we had insight from the head of Cross School in Three Crosses and members who were on the committee at that time will remember a heartwarming and brilliant insight about the value and power and importance of outdoor learning. And, and he said something I'll never forget. Happy children learn. Don't over egg the pudding, don't complicate things. Happy children learn. So that needs to be a challenge in this. How do we in, in create that culture of, of a learning environment for all? Um, but with a particular focus on, again, die with the pupil development grant and, and uh, or deprivation grant and disadvantage. How do we unpick that word disadvantage so that we understand the impact as Elaine said, uh, adverse childhood experiences, the impact of trauma, of, of things like moving, of divorce, of of um, uh, prison, of crime impact on families, of uh, substance misuse. So, so the, the the challenges are very significant. But we do, in a sense, have a captive audience. You know, our children are coming to school. We have them. We are there. And and my last comment, I would be about this excellence that we see and examples of best practice as well. Um, 
So th those are my feelings and my comments for what they're worth on, on where we go in here. But it's making those areas tangible and real as we go forward uh, and pinning things down. As we said previously, it's not about theory. This is about the practice of educational excellence. Can I see Councillor Fiona G uh, Gordon's hand up? Fiona? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, David, um, for the presentation. And I'm really interested in this idea of progress um, and assessment. So am I right in thinking that, um, that there is that there is no measure now? There's no gauge about children should be doing something at a certain age. OK, as the, Elaine referred to. So Councillor White referred earlier to consistency, you know, across clusters. So are we um, up on you know, measuring progress is important for identifying additional learning needs, isn't it? Because that's key to um, identifying whether children have um, a, a, an additional learning need is that they, they, they're not making progress. And you referred earlier in your slides to um, children making appropriate pay, pace of progress. So I just wondered what is appropriate? Um, and I know that it's, I, I guess your answer is going to be it's all individual to a child, but if there's a pace that's really quite slow or if, a, you know, in, in years gone by, we would say if a child was sort of two years behind their peers, then they've got, you know, a significant need. I'm just wondering how in the new framework we identify um, um, progress and and also how do uh, how does this um, impact when children move from school to school, you know, a, a, a across Swansea or outside of Swansea and, and so on? Just just that notion of progress. OK, thanks for your Chair, you, do you want me, if you're happy to feel that now? Yes, uh, yes, please do. So thanks. Yeah, a really good question and one that sits quite high. Um, uh, it's asked frequently rather. So there's a couple of things that are in place. One, um, the, the progression steps that have been described do contain a set of descriptions of learning and the descriptions of learning are, are um, like flags or signposts in the road so they provide a set of descriptions which give us an indication of, of where pupils could be so for example there's a couple of can do statements in 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 the descriptors of learning which you as a practitioner would read and it gives you an idea of where uh, broadly speaking a pupil is so we that helps us Secondly, there's still expectations set out in the literacy, numeracy and digital competence frameworks, which are based on the same progression step model. So again, we've got a sense of where pupils should be. We've got the personalised assessments, which are a standardised national test. OK, yes, they're from year two to year six, sorry, from year two to year nine, again, providing us with a standardised idea of whereabouts a pupil is. And there's a number of other um, formative correction summative assessments that um, schools use. We haven't got a standard, but that schools use to ascertain um, a, a certain um, position, right? And, and a number of those are accessed for our youngest pupils and learners in our flying start settings, for example, that are co-located with our 18 primary schools. Um, so there's a fair bit of stuff. <laughs> now, the other bit that exist in the guidance is a statutory responsibility on schools to undertake um, what we, they call an non-entry assessment, literacy, numeracy, um, well-being and physical development. There's a little bit of inconsistency in the way that's being applied at the moment. However, schools have got a responsibility to undertake that task. Now, you are right. There's going to be inconsistency in what that looks like from setting to setting. Um, however, there is an expectation for all schools and setting to set out their plan for a shared understanding of progression. So each school and or setting has a responsibility to share their, their baseline um, approaches with other schools and settings. We as a local authority have got a responsibility, like I said, to the transition individual to try and pull those together a bit. Um, so yeah, there is going to be a bit more autonomy However, lastly, to answer your question, absolutely, it's going to be about that individual learner. The, the previous model did not allow that because we, we they, they were pitched against um, uh, a, a marker on a fence. And, and if they didn't get there, well, we reported on it and so what. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really welcome in. But mm -hmm. please, you know, be reassured there are systems and processes in place which schools are utilising in order to help them, uh, you know, make that judgment about inappropriate mm -hmm. pace and progress i hope that's okay yeah thank you yeah great thanks fiona thanks day uh, can i go next to councillor Lyndon jones please 
Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> when Fiona mentioned about consistency across the clusters, I know in scrutiny we've met about three clusters and they're comprehensive schools and, and it is different. Um, and, it, and I know uh, speaking to uh, Dai and Dai has been along at those meetings and we can see that. So I think it's really important. A lot of it is very often about the chemistry between the people who are members of that cluster. Uh, you know, we met the clusters, we met the chair of governors and we met the head in each uh, and and of all the primary and then of course the the comprehensive uh in each occasion um and i think it's about chemistry and i think that's really important and and the other thing is and i know it does happen is is about sharing good practice not just amongst the cluster but between clusters and i think that is vital so that we can all learn from it um but I think, you know, yes, they are different uh, and we are all different, so it will be different. But I think it is important we take them all with us on that journey. Thank you, Lyndon. Can I ask next if um, Councillor Mike White. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Yes, th thanks, Dai. Yeah, you just touched now on um, Flying Start. Now, I, I don't think um, that I think when they look to do um, bring in flying start there, I believe that some areas that should be into flying start are not actually included in it within Swansea because there are issues within those areas with deprivation and poverty, unfortunately. Um, but I think, but there again, then because these children then have got that opportunity plus to go to flying start the school is already having to uh, catch up so th these children are obviously haven't had the, the, the sort of experience of going to a school or the school settings or surroundings as they would probably their their perhaps you know uh, friends or um um relatives in in other areas where they've had that opportunity so i think you know it is it is important i feel that every child is given the best start for their education but you know a school day you can never tell you know it starts at 10 to 9 you don't know what you're going to face and teachers today are not just teachers as you know yourself being there as their teacher your social workers your uh, you know everything you jack of all trades so i i i hope that uh, when when curriculum for wheels is comes in that you know that everything is sort of leveled out so that you know, the, the the professionals in the classroom have got every opportunity to um, um, give the give the best to, to, to those children that they that they have to teach. Uh, but I think you know that's the only concern I have. Day is that you know because there's uh, inconsistencies with children starting school. Um, you know, at that age for flying start, that they, these I feel these children are the ones that that, that obviously have, have, have got to catch up. And I think more importantly as well, they we've obviously got to get the parents and guardians on board as well to support the school and what what we want to achieve. Thank you, Mike. Dai. Yeah, Mike. Obviously, you know, in reference to the the flying start um, allocation, and you know. I'm not in a position to defend or otherwise, but um, obviously based on the, um, you know, the lower level super output areas in Swansea at the time, you know, a call was made. We've got 18 settings in Swansea that are co-located. Um, so they've got the full suite of the four offer from Flying Start. So the Flying Start provision, healthcare, speech and language and parenting. And whilst not every one of our 78 primary schools um, I've got access to that. The Flying Start expansion program uh, is allowing parents access to the childcare provision in a, in, a, in a greater number of cases. And what, just to put your mind at ease, Mike, what I can tell you is we have learned from those Flying Start settings. So where there isn't a Flying Start setting in a primary school, but there is a local um, childcare setting, um, and whether that's part of the Flying Start expansion program or otherwise, we're trying to emulate the transition arrangements that we see in a Flying Start setting that's co-located to those private nurseries and settings and support parents in the transition. So we're getting better at it, but you are right. There, there is a con inconsistency because some have offer and some don't. However, what I am telling you is that we as nursery school practitioners 
are, ho are trying our best to emulate the effective practice that we found in those settings to gather the information about pupils as early as possible so we can use those baseline assessments in order to inform inform the next step planning while when they when those pupils come into the nursery setting so you know this this it's getting better definitely and we've learned from our flying start settings i hope that makes you feel a bit better about it mike yeah as i say did i think you know you've obviously been head teachers have you've obviously seen the issues as they say but i think you know staff you know i've got you know i've really you know i've really got to sort of you know work that that relax already i need to try and you know pull pull everybody together you know but uh that, that's my only concern that everybody moves along at that the at the gives you gets the opportunity to move along at the same same pace of learning That's excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Di. I can't see anybody indicating. No one indicating online or in the room. So I'm going to make a few little concluding comments. Thank you very much, Di, again, for, for excellence and insight. Um, as we go forward, what are we measuring progress of? For me now, just to encapsulate this, what does success look like for that young person? Uh, are we looking three to 16 or are we looking three to 30? You know, that sort of thinking. What are we preparing young people, children, young people for as we go forward? So in a sense, the feeling I got through some of that presentation was this about the long game. It's about the really looking long game. And Mike touched upon the importance of engaging parents and guardians. I take that a bit further. Of course, all the practitioners involved with the school, but critically to engage community members as well. Um, and uh, mums, dads, aunts, uncles, anyone who, who can add value to the learning experience. The question that I'd, I'd urge us to have as we go forward is, what's the point of school? What's the point of education? I know it's very, very basic, but let's m not make any assumptions here. Some of us value education and have continued to spend our lives in education, um, but we're not all in that uh, the same category. So what, however tough the nut seems to be, there's always a way if we've got the intent to look for it. And if we get our Swansea way, right, then maybe we'll have those firm principles, we'll increase confidence, share good practice and consistent ways of working. Um, and that will add value uh, right across the 90, what have we got, 93, 94 schools in Swansea. We're on that journey. It's ambitious, uh, but uh, we are nothing if we don't have uh, without our aspiration and ambition for all our children. So can I thank Di and thank Elaine again for those excellent insights today and thank all committee members as we move forward on to agenda item number six. And that is our education skills work plan for 2024-2025. Um, so we've got the work plan as set out. As I said, we've got uh, po support in positive behaviour on the 23rd of October, then 4th of December, learner progress, 15th of January, supporting positive behaviour uh, with Kate Phillips, and then 19th of Feb February, we'll be back to learner progress with Di, and then in April, on the 9th of April, we'll have a, a committee meeting where our final report or reports come together, one report with two sections or two reports. I'm looking at Sarah, our report expert there. Um, and uh, we will then hopefully draw a line under th these meetings and we produce something really positive and meaningful to go forward. Um, I've proposed one change I hope committee members will be happy with. I've spoken to Kate Phillips about it. Um, and that is that in October, we were planning to have some insights from colleagues attached to substance misuse and understanding the impact of substance misuse. Um, but I've spoken to Kate because she's been holding her... Oh, feedback there. OK, is that? Oh, there we had some feedback. Sorry, I spoke to Kate about moving two of her committees around. So on the 23rd of October, we're going to have feedback from Kate from her behaviour sessions that she's held in the Towers Hotel with um, Swansea schools, but wider multi-agency partners who work with and around Swansea schools as well. She held the second of those meetings this week and she said she'd be in a position to be able to feed back to this committee on the 23rd of October. Uh, so that means then we'll be asking colleagues in the context of substance misuse, particularly from South Wales Police, because there's some brilliant thinking going on there. Colleagues to come along in uh, in the, the January. 
uh, January the 15th uh, committee meeting. Are we content, colleagues, with that, that little change? It doesn't alter the structure of the meetings, it's just the content will change slightly. OK? Lovely. Thank you very much. Well, on that point, I can't see any anybody indicating. I don't think we've got anything to, to add. And on that point, can I thank you, as always, for your insight and, and your, your brilliance? And I'll close the meeting at that point. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.